epilepsy warning for flashing lights and colors. For quite some time, rides and attractions have been sponsored by various companies. These companies pay amusement parks to put their brand name on attractions. This not only helps bring awareness to the brand's product, but it allows the park to make some extra money as well. Over the years though, some sponsorships have ranged from innocuous, to unexpected, to downright controversial. Today, we're going to look back on some of the most memorable and unusual sponsored attractions ever conceived. But not all sponsorships are the same, so for this video, we'll be taking a look at several different categories of parks. We'll look at how Disney got the ball rolling, how Six Flags handled their sponsorships, and how various British parks used thrill rides to advertise. Quick note though, this won't include attractions based on intellectual properties. Parks often pay the owners of said properties a licensing fee, whereas sponsorship deals involve the brand paying the park. Let's start things off with the happiest place on earth. Part 1. Disney. Our story begins in the 1950s with the development of Disneyland in Anaheim, California. At the time, the concept of a massive theme park was brand new and highly ambitious. Walt Disney's ambition for the park was so high that he wasn't able to fund its construction on his own. In order to help pay for his theme park, Disney got in contact with various corporations to help fund its attractions. These funds would not only pay for the ride's construction, but their maintenance as well. And in exchange, these companies would have their brands exposed to thousands of potential consumers visiting the park. Upon Disneyland's opening in 1955, there were plenty of corporate sponsored attractions intermingled with the ones based on Disney films. From the moment guests entered the park, they were met with various brands setting up shop on Main Street. Just past the information booth was a music hall, presented by and named after piano manufacturer Verlitzer. Here guests could purchase musical instruments. One advertisement touted pianos as low as $495. Just imagine going to Disneyland and buying a freaking piano. Besides this store, there was also a coffee shop sponsored by Maxwell House. Perhaps the most infamous one was a lingerie store sponsored by the Hollywood Maxwell Brazier Company. Yes, you could actually buy women's underwear at Disneyland too. The store named Intimate Apparel, Braziers, and Torcelettes was more than just an underwear shop though. In fact, it was an attraction of its own. Inside was a talking figure of a man in a turban named, no joke, the Wonderful Wizard of Bras. The wizard would play a brief spiel about the history of women's undergarments, and small displays would highlight the evolution of lingerie over the years. Definitely wouldn't fly today, but a fascinating example nonetheless. Beyond Main Street, opening day also presented the Monsanto Hall of Chemistry and the Kaiser Aluminum Hall of Fame, which were exactly as interesting as they sounded. A few weeks after opening, Disneyland would also open Casa de Fritos, a Mexican restaurant sponsored by the Frito-Lay Chip Company. Just like Hollywood Maxwell, Frito-Lay would go the extra mile to make this more of an attraction than an ordinary retail venue. Here, a figure of the Frito Kid would lick his lips next to a chip dispenser that looked like a mine. Guests would insert coins, which would send a bag of chips down the slide. Over the years, Disney would continue to bring sponsored attractions to their parks. However, Walt Disney was said to be unhappy with having to resort to corporate sponsors. These attractions were built out of necessity for funding rather than being a part of his creative vision. But after his death in 1966, such deals would continue. In 1967, the Monsanto Company would once again sponsor an attraction. This dark ride named Adventures Through Inner Space focused on a surreal journey to the center of a snowflake. The ride was acclaimed by parkgoers for its special effects and ambition, and it has since developed a cult following. Then in 1972, Eastern Airlines sponsored an Omnimover dark ride called If You Had Wings. This attraction used projection screens to showcase various popular tourist destinations. Through the use of a catchy jingle, guests were told that they could enjoy all of these destinations with Eastern Airlines. To this day, the ride invokes warm nostalgia among park fans with more people remembering the If You Had Wings jingle than the fact that it was basically a commercial. Even better, since Eastern Airlines wanted as many people to ride it as possible, the ride was absolutely free, not requiring any tickets like the park's other attractions did. Another memorable sponsorship led to a culinary phenomenon. In 1976, the Dole Food Company would take over sponsorship of the Enchanted Tiki Room. They also started sponsoring the adjacent Tiki Bar food stand. 
Ten years later, the stand would start selling Dole Whip, a delicious frozen dessert that's still a favorite among Disney Park fans. All of this was only the beginning for Disney-sponsored attractions. In 1982, Disney World in Florida would open Epcot. In addition to the Multicultural World Showcase area, the park would feature Future World, a land based on the most recent innovations in science and technology. The land was separated into several different pavilions, each being sponsored by a company that fit the theme. Spaceship Earth, themed to communication, was sponsored by phone company Bell System, now known as AT&T. The land pavilion, themed to food and agriculture, was sponsored by food company Kraft. The World of Motion pavilion, themed to automobiles, was sponsored by car company General Motors. The Universe of Energy pavilion, themed to, well, energy, was sponsored by fuel company Exxon. The Imagination Pavilion, themed to creativity, was sponsored by photography company Kodak. Finally, Communicore, themed to innovation, would feature several private companies showcasing their latest technology. Over the years, more sponsored pavilions would open. The Wonders of Life Pavilion, themed to health and fitness, was sponsored by life insurance company MetLife. The Living Seas Pavilion, themed to oceanic studies, was sponsored by tech conglomerate United Technologies. Finally, the Horizons Dark Ride, themed to innovative technology, was sponsored by the General Electric Company. These sponsors would change over the years. For example, when the World of Motion was replaced by the Thrill Ride Test Track, General Motors would continue their sponsorship until 2012, when their division company Chevrolet would take over. Nestle would also take over the Land Pavilion sponsorship from 1993 to 2009. Unlike if you had wings, these promotional elements were much more subtle. These attractions didn't focus specifically on the sponsors, but the promising innovations in each of their fields. This was the perfect balance of getting the word out and letting the attraction stand out on its own. Instead of feeling like they were being advertised to, guests felt like they were being shown glimpses of what the future had in store for technology. The corporate sponsorships didn't stop there though. In the late 1980s, the one and only McDonald's was set to sponsor Disneyland's Splash Mountain. The company had been working with Disney for a while, and the fast food chain would spend millions on advertising the new ride. This included a tie-in giveaway game called Splash for Cash, where you could win free food and free passes for Disneyland. There were even plans to have a McDonald's food stand right outside the attraction. However, due to technical difficulties, the ride would end up opening six months behind schedule, which greatly irritated McDonald's. A good majority of the passes they gave away were used by guests disappointed with the ride's delays, which made them look like clowns, and not in a good way. Almost a decade later, McDonald's would finally get to fully sponsor a Disney attraction. In fact, they would sponsor an entire themed land. Upon the opening of Disney World's Animal Kingdom Park, McDonald's would sponsor a dinosaur-themed area named Dino Land USA. While the land was criticized for being dull and incomplete, it was still home to an A-list attraction. This ride, then known as Countdown to Extinction, would focus on guests being sent by scientists to save an iguanodon from the infamous asteroid. With special effects, immersive set pieces, and detailed animatronics, it would be a high-intensity and flat-out thrilling dark ride. Outside of the ride, McDonald's would have charming posters that advertise the attraction, each with a parody of the restaurant's own famous slogans. You've got, have you had a crocodilian today? Did somebody say Styracosaurus? And food, fangs, and fun. Inside the actual attraction though, things were much more subtle, and there were no references to the restaurant in the ride's story. Once again, Disney played the balancing act to perfection. There was, however, a small easter egg. If you look at the wall on your left, you'll see three pipes, each with a chemical formula on them. As indicated by the chemical formulas, the red pipe represents ketchup, the yellow pipe represents mustard, and the white pipe represents mayo. This subtle sponsorship integration didn't feel out of place or take away from the immersive story. Just imagine if the ride vehicles were plastered with the McDonald's logo, and instead of the Carnotaurus, you encountered giant evil grimaces. It would be tacky and out of place, although I'd personally pay good money to ride something like that. McDonald's would go on to drop their sponsorship in 2008, but these pipes are still in place today. As the years went on, countless companies put their brand names on various attractions. At one point, Mattel sponsored It's a Small World and FedEx sponsored Space Mountain. One of the more interesting sponsored Disney rides was the AT&T sponsorship of the Indiana Jones Adventure. AT&T would use this sponsorship as an avenue to promote their long-distance calls. 
Various sections of the queue featured coded messages written in quote-unquote maraglyphs. Guests were given decoder cards which advertised the phone company and allowed them to decipher the messages. These messages still remain on the walls today. In addition, there's a sign that reads, True rewards await those who choose wisely. This not only references the Last Crusade, but it also serves as a tongue-in-cheek advertisement for AT&T. Later on in 2007, the Hanes brand of underwear began sponsoring Rockin' Roller Coaster. For around a decade, you could find the Hanes logo on the guitar at the entrance. Deals like these would continue through the 2010s, but in recent years, the Disney company has grown significantly since the early days of Disneyland. Financially, they are much less reliant on sponsors to help build and operate their attractions. With so many IPs under their belt, Disney has shifted away from working with corporations to develop attractions, and instead uses their attractions to promote their own properties. Even if a company did want to sponsor an attraction, doing so would cost millions of dollars a year. To put it bluntly, advertising at a Disney park is not cheap. As a result, many companies don't feel like paying millions of dollars to slap a logo on a ride entrance. So today, you see much less sponsorships than in the 20th century. Aside from Disney though, there are plenty of ride sponsorship opportunities, ones that are much less expensive. Part 2, Six Flags. Outside of Disney, we've seen plenty of other amusement parks feature sponsored rides over the years. Perhaps the most prominent examples of these would be from the one and only Six Flags amusement chain. As far back as the late 70s, Nestle sponsored some of Six Flags log flume rides. At Missouri Six Flags St. Louis, the park named their log flume the Nestle Plunge. This was based on the advertising campaign of the same name, which involved people falling backwards into water. According to some park guests, the park went as far as to dye the water brown so that it looked like iced tea, though you wouldn't have wanted to drink it. Furthermore, right before the main drop, a sign was placed on the tro that read, Take the Nestle Plunge. The log flume at New Jersey Six Flags Great Adventure would also feature this sign. Not only that, but it would feature the catchphrase at the entrance, along with a cutout of a refreshing glass of iced tea. Later on at Great Adventure, the park's Lightning Loop Shuttle Coaster experience would be sponsored by Dr. Pepper. This sponsorship was simple, as all the park had to do was place a logo on the ride sign. Even for the time, roller coasters were expensive not only to build, but maintain as well. And these kind of brand deals would undoubtedly boost funding for the park's attractions. As a result, this would be far from the only sponsored attraction at Great Adventure, with many others coming over the years. In its early years, racing wooden coaster Rolling Thunder was sponsored by Doritos, and a big orange sign was located by the station. At another point, a smaller sign advertising Head & Shoulders brand shampoo was placed by it. Later on, their Aero Mega Looper Great American Scream Machine would have not one, but several sponsorships over the years. These would include Scope brand Mouthwash, Electronics Company Magnavox, Shoe brand LA Gear, and Slim Jim. Another attraction with multiple sponsors was their Rapids Ride. Brand deals included Cheerios, Sunoco, Transworld Airlines, and Tide. Beyond this, Bic sponsored the Wave Swinger, Delta Airlines sponsored the Sky Ride, Chupa Chup sponsored their Intamin First Gen Drop Tower, video game company Sega sponsored Runaway Mine Train, and even the Lost Parents and Infant Center was sponsored by Pampers brand Diapers. At the dawn of the 2000s, Great Adventure would rename their Hydro Flume ride to the Poland Spring Plunge. This was, of course, sponsored by the bottled water brand of the same name. Admittedly, Poland Spring Plunge rolls off the tongue quite well. And this wasn't the only ride that had this name. The Log Flume at Six Flags New England would also don it. I admittedly couldn't find many sponsorship photos from other Six Flags parks at the time, though there were bound to be even more of these at other parks in the chain. Up until this point, sponsorship deals were mainly limited to ride signage, but during the 2000s, Six Flags would massively expand its own brand and stuff their parks with new and very expensive roller coasters. Likely as a result of this, the company's sponsorship deals became much more aggressive. Six Flags would soon develop the habit of wrapping their rides in advertisements for guests to see. All across the chain, top attractions and roller coasters would have vehicles literally covered in advertisements. There are too many of these to count, and the practice is still in place to this day, but here's some of the memorable ones I could find. At Six Flags Over Texas, bobsled coaster La Vibora was decked out in a Metro PCS ad for the 2013 season. This ad would also promote Android, as Metro was touting its unlimited Android offer at the time. 
At Six Flags Over Georgia, the Georgia Scorcher stand-up coaster served as a church's chicken advertisement. Church's field marketing manager at the time said of the deal, quote, It's just one more way we're bringing the love to our loyal guests and chicken lovers everywhere, whether it be at the drive through or 100 feet up. At Six Flags Magic Mountain, the park's suspended roller coaster Ninja would be plastered with an ad for the Karate Kid remake starring Jaden Smith. Just recently, I spotted a Takis ad on Six Flags Fiesta Texas' Boomerang coaster as well. Some of the earliest examples I could find are once again from Great Adventure. King to Ka, the tallest roller coaster on Earth, was once sponsored by Panasonic with a small sign in the queue. Later on though, this Intamin roller coaster would be sponsored by Schwarzkopf. Not the defunct coaster manufacturer, but the hair products company. Specifically, this wrap advertised their Got To Be Hair Gel, which promised to give your spikes a screaming hold. Towards the end of its lifespan, the Great American Scream Machine would be sponsored by Axe Brand Deodorant, with ad wrap trains and big advertising posters in the station. Of course, you can't talk about coaster ads without bringing up perhaps the most famous example of all time, El Toro. Around 2011, this world-class wooden roller coaster was given a new train design. This coaster, themed to a Spanish bull, opened with a train meant to resemble a wooden crate with a gold bull's head in the front. The redesign, however, would give it vibrant colors to advertise stride gum, citrus mint, and berry mint flavors. The train had received a mixed reception, with some describing it as eye candy while others criticizing it for clashing with the theming. The next season, though, a new sponsor train was revealed that would cause yet another stir. Say hello to the Kia Soul train. This train resembled the 2012 red Kia Soul, with each car having windows, wheels, door handles, and headlights. While this train also received some criticism, it still remains on the coaster to this day. And to be honest, it's a pretty intricate and creative way to sponsor a coaster. Of course, the original train design is also still operational, but either way, you'll still be riding perhaps the best wooden coaster on Earth. Also worth noting is a sign in the queue that says, Last Chance to Exit Before Riding. This clever sign appropriately features a picture of a chicken, and its sponsor is Premio, a brand of sausages. Sponsorships at Six Flags aren't likely to die out anytime soon, and there are plenty more of them that I haven't brought up. Even some of the staircases are covered in M&M's advertisements. Just go to your local Six Flags park and you'll see tons of ads. Company officials encourage such deals online, saying, quote, Six Flags serves as a destination for guests of all ages which allows brands like yours the perfect opportunity to connect with potential key consumers. Creating custom partnership programs that add memorable interactions for our guests enhances their overall experience, and places your brand directly in front of the consumer while they are at their most receptive state during a thrill-packed, entertaining day. While Six Flags definitely has a reputation for sponsorships, the worst one by far was their misguided attempt to put virtual reality on roller coasters. At first this sounds like an interesting idea on paper, but the process of sanitizing the headsets, fitting them on each passenger's head, and loading the ride vehicles in a timely fashion was an operational nightmare. Coasters that featured this experience would suffer from bloated wait times, and both guests and staff were said to be incredibly frustrated. This subject alone is worth its own video. Overall, Six Flags and sponsorships continue to go hand in hand. On the contrary, the practice of sponsorships extends far beyond Six Flags. In fact, you can find plenty of famous examples across the Atlantic. Part 3, The UK The earliest example of a sponsored UK attraction that I'm aware of is the Coca-Cola Roller at 1988's Glasgow Garden Festival in Scotland. This park only operated for one year, and it was part of a larger initiative to renovate and urbanize unattractive industrial land. Organizers intended to sell the land to potential retailers and wanted to make it look as impressive as possible. This festival would feature a number of sponsored attractions, but the Coca-Cola Roller was certainly the most thrilling. This would be a standard boomerang coaster by Dutch manufacturer Vacoma, taking guests forwards and backwards through three inversions. The track and supports were white, while the train was bright red, sporting the Coca-Cola logo. After the festival, the coaster would be relocated twice, once to Derbyshire England's American Adventure theme park, and once again to Suffolk's Pleasurewood Hills, where it still operates today. Not to be outdone, there was also a Pepsi roller coaster, though this one was much smaller. First debuting on the traveling fair circuit, this coaster named Pepsi Cola Loop was built by Italian manufacturer Pinfari. 
It was a standard ZL42 model with a compact layout and one loop. On top of this loop was a sign with the Pepsi logo on it which would light up at night. Eventually, it was sold to Wales Ocean Beach Amusement Park and today, it sits at Azadi Park in Iraq's Kurdistan region. Of course, this wouldn't be the last Pepsi-themed coaster to open in the country. In 1994, Pepsi would sponsor a massive attraction at England's Blackpool Pleasure Beach. This coaster was named the Pepsi Max Big One. This ride would serve to promote Pepsi Max, a high-caffeine, low-calorie alternative to Pepsi and Diet Pepsi. At 213 feet tall, this would open as the tallest full-circuit roller coaster on Earth, giving guests an astounding view of the Irish Sea. Aside from having the same color scheme as the Pepsi logo, the coaster was built with a soda can tunnel just before the lift hill. The coaster was a massive success for the park, and it certainly wasn't their only sponsored attraction. The 90s would also see the park's aero launch loop called Revolution renamed the Iron Brew Revolution. This coaster was sponsored by Iron Brew, a famous Scottish soft drink which many consider their official beverage. The park repainted the station to resemble a giant iron brew can. But that wasn't all, the track and supports were repainted to match the drink's logo. Plus, the logo would be plastered on both the trains and the supports. Suffice to say, there was nothing subtle about this brand deal. Not to be outdone, fellow English Park Frontierland Western Theme Park would open its own food-themed thrill ride. The attraction was a massive Intamin gyro tower named Polo Tower. Its sponsor was a brand of mints named Polo, and the structure would resemble a pack of them. This would end up being a pretty rare attraction, as the park closed just four years after the ride's opening. While it was still up and running though, Blackpool Pleasure Beach seemed to respond with its own sponsored tower ride. In 1997, the park opened a brand new space shot ride from American manufacturer SNS Worldwide. After initially deciding to build the attraction, the park was approached by Sony, who struck a deal to promote their hit PlayStation game console. As a result, the ride was literally named PlayStation The Ride. The platform would have a PlayStation color scheme, banners advertising the PlayStation were placed on the car, and the top of the tower had the system's logo. Back on the subject of soda-sponsored coasters, fellow English park Southport Pleasureland would open their own two years later in 1999. This was a Vacoma SLC inverted coaster named Traumatizer. Despite the model's reputation as a rough ride though, the name wasn't based on its discomfort. Instead, it was a play on words, advertising a red citrus flavored soft drink named Tizer. While I can't say for sure how rough it was, it was likely a fitting name. Three years later, 2002 would be unofficially known as the year of the sponsored ride, as several of them would pop up across the country. At Southport Pleasureland, another sponsored tower attraction would debut. This one was sponsored by yet another soft drink. This time, it was named the Leucozade Energy Space Shot. And for those of you outside of the UK wondering what the hell a Leucozade is, it's actually a play on words, combining the sweetener glucose and aid. I guess Fructozade didn't roll off the tongue as well. Back at Blackpool Pleasure Beach, two more sponsored attractions opened. The first was Spin Doctor, presented by Wall's Cornetto Soft Brand Ice Cream. The second would be a family ride named the Eddie Stobart Convoy Ride, presented by British logistics company Eddie Stobart. And I apologize if I pronounced that wrong. But by far the biggest sponsored attraction of 2002 was at Fantasy Island. Like Traumatizer, this would be another SLC, only this one was much, much bigger. This coaster, named the Jubilee Odyssey, was named after the Golden Jubilee, an international celebration to honor Queen Elizabeth II's 50th year on the throne. Aside from the name though, the ride itself would have nothing to do with the Queen. When it first opened, the coaster was sponsored by Nestle's Kit Kat Bar, with the logo prominently featured on the entrance and a red and white color scheme to match it. Its 124 foot tall vertical loop is the tallest inversion of its kind on an inverted coaster. And at 167 feet tall, this attraction remains the tallest full-circuit inverted coaster in all of Europe. And here's a quick fun fact. This coaster was actually supposed to be even taller, with the original height said to be 265 feet. However, noise concerns from locals caused the park to lower the height. All of these sponsorships and more would help British amusement parks boost their profits over the years. For the most part, everything seemed par for the course, but in 2011, Alton Towers brought about perhaps the most controversial sponsorship deal at the time. You may be aware of the roller coaster Oblivion, 
This coaster, built by Swiss manufacturer Bolliger and Mabillard, would be the company's first ever dive coaster model. Its dark foreboding story involves the roller coaster itself being a dark experiment to test the physical and mental limits of its passengers. The coaster's all-black paint scheme and industrial aesthetic blends well with the surrounding X sector area. However, in 2011, the park's parent company Merlin Entertainment decided it would be a good idea to literally plaster Fanta ads all over the attraction. You would see the Fanta logo everywhere you looked. There were ads in the queue, ads in the boarding station, and even an ad at the bottom of the drop. Sure, Oblivion had previously had a Coca-Cola sponsorship, but that brand deal was much more subtle. With Fanta's sponsorship, the bright orange colors and happy-go-lucky nature of these ads severely clashed with the intimidating theming of the area. In fact, these ads were so hated by park fans, a Facebook protest group was set up called, no joke, Enthusiasts Against Oblivion's Fanta Sponsorship. The page description reads, quote, This is a page for all those enthusiasts out there who believe that Fanta has destroyed our beloved Oblivion. This ride is meant to be intimidating, not tacky and cute. Among its posts are irate updates about more advertising being added to the area, with the page owner encouraging guests to yell, Fanta sucks on the drop. Furthermore, Towers Times, which is among the biggest Alton Towers fan sites out there, actually sent a petition for the ads to be toned down to Merlin Entertainment CEO Nick Varney. Varney actually went to visit the ride himself, only to agree with the sponsorship's critics. Varney released a statement saying, quote, I recently walked through the entire Oblivion queue and ride station area. There is no doubt that unlike the original Coke branding, this is not themed as sensitively to the ride concept as it could have been. I cannot make any promises at this stage as we have a contract with Coca-Cola, but we are making efforts to see what we can do to improve the situation. We take the integrity of theming and story for our rides and attractions very seriously, so please regard this as a one-off which is not a symptom of more to come. In the end, park fans would be victorious, and the garish Fanta ads were soon pulled from the ride. Over the years, many of the aforementioned sponsorships would be changed or removed entirely. The Jubilee Odyssey would lose its Kit Kat sponsorship and was eventually repainted and renamed to just The Odyssey. Southport Pleasureland's Traumatizer would eventually be relocated to Blackpool Pleasure Beach, and it currently operates under the name Infusion. Meanwhile, the Iron Brew Revolution would be renamed to just The Revolution after the 2011 season. Furthermore, PlayStation The Ride would lose its Sony sponsorship around 2002. The ride was later sponsored and renamed to Tango Ice Blast, a brand of frozen drinks. Surprisingly, while the Pepsi Max Big One has since been renamed to just the Big One, it's still sponsored by the Pepsi Company. It even still has its soda can tunnel. We certainly have covered a lot of ground today, but in reality, we've only scratched the surface on sponsored attractions. There are other famous examples around the world that I didn't have time for. These include a roller coaster in St. Petersburg sponsored by a meat processing plant, T Express being sponsored by telecommunications company SK Telecom, and Blue Fire at Germany's Europa Park being formerly sponsored by the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline. From the old ads to the new, it seems that as long as amusement parks are expensive to build and operate, sponsorships will continue to play a role in how we experience them. And now, once again, it's time for the comment shoutout program. This is where I take three random comments from my previous video and read them out loud. If you want to see your comment in my video, feel free to comment down below and it may be selected. Just know though that no inflammatory comments will be chosen. Anyway, these comments are from my Top 20 90s Coasters video. Nanakathy8499 says, This is the geekiest coaster video I have ever seen, and that's saying a lot. This was one of your best videos. Thank you, Kathy. Ravenly Wren says, quote, My first ever roller coaster was Raptor at Cedar Point when I was 10. And Daniel Ward says, quote, Nemesis is amazing. On the back row, it feels like your feet are being ripped off. Before we wrap things up, I just want to give a special shout out to my new Patreon supporters. Verbal shout outs start at the gold tier, so if you don't hear your name, it will be listed at the end of the video. Here's a special shout out to AJ Dana. Thank you all so much, and if you want to support me on Patreon, you can do so once again at the link in the description. Thanks for watching everyone, feel free to like, share, and subscribe. You can follow me on social media on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, or you can check out my website at ThemeParkCrazy.com. This is Theme Park Crazy, and I'll see you all next time.